Hey guys, it's Amy. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you're all having a wonderful day as always. You know who's not having a wonderful day? Ezra McCandless. And that makes me have an even better day. So if you don't already know, Ezra McCandless was recently sentenced for the murder of Alex Woodworth and the sentencing hearing was held last Friday, February 7th, 2020. Before I get any further in, uh, I just want to let you know that I am going to be talking about the sentencing hearing and the case as well in some detail. So if you haven't already watched the case or the hearing, you might want to do that before you continue watching this. So just a quick spoiler alert for you guys. Okay, and if you are looking for more information on the Ezra McCandless case, you can go to my channel, Mind Squash. And you can watch my earlier video of the Ezra McCandless case. I will also post the link below so you guys can just uh, click right on it there. So with that said, let's talk about the sentencing. I have said several times that the Ezra McCandless case has been just bonkers. Such a strange case. And the sentencing has been just the same. Sentencing was also crazy. It was a very strange sentencing, I think, anyway. If you've watched sentencing hearings, usually the basic gist is they're going to hand down a penalty. And with regard to Ezra McCandless, the only choice was really that she was going to get a mandatory life sentence. It was just whether or not she was going to get parole and when she was going to get a chance at parole. So that was going to be the case. The judge was going to have to decide on that. And so the prosecution and the defense was going to you know, get to kind of play their case a little bit. But mainly the sentencing, the sentencing, I cannot say that word, the sentencing hearing is really just family and friends of the victim has the chance to give a victim impact speech. So they get to sit there and look directly at the murderer, Ezra McCandless, and tell her what she's done to them. How wonderful Alex was and how she took that away from them and what a terrible person she is, potentially, if that's what they want to say. So there's usually a few of them. Sometimes they talk for themselves at these hearings. Sometimes they have someone else. Sometimes the, the prosecutor read a letter for them. In this case, there were several people that came up and talked for Alex, and then there were several letters that were read. And then also there's a few people that also talk for Ezra kind of in her defense to try to help her get a, a lower sentence, presumably. There's usually a few on each side, not many. And the sentencing hearing takes maybe an hour, maybe two hours, something like that. I don't recall them being extremely long, but this one was long. It seemed to me that it went on for a large majority of the day. I was watching it for quite some time. It was very interesting, very, very sad and it just, you know, brings back right to the top surface of your emotions how awful and horrific this was. And you really get to feel for the family members and the friends of the victim, Alex Woodworth. And it was just, it was very sad. I have a lot to say about the sentencing. The judge did say, as was given several different stories, and he said a couple of things. He was very nice. I love this judge. He very much explained his reasoning. He got into a lot of detail about his reasoning for his sentencing. And he said that she could possibly give another story now, or at some point in the future, to tell us what happened. But... Even then, we won't know what really happened because she lies so much that we have we would never know whether she's telling the truth or not. So I thought that was pretty interesting that even the judge was saying, listen, this chick lies. She's made up several stories. We cannot believe her, so we'll never know. That's true. That's true. We're not going to know. There's no video recording of this incident. There's no legitimate proof to say exactly what happened, A, B, C, D. We just have the gist kind of from beginning to end. And there's this whole clump of who the hell knows what happened in that crazy ass crime scene that we still don't know about. But first of all, I'll, I'll tell you the sentencing. I'm going to tell you what the sentencing is. So shut it off if you don't want to know yet. Like it's the end of a movie or something. The judge sentenced her to life in prison 
with the eligibility for extended supervision, which is basically parole, in 50 years. So basically, the defense was asking for the chance at parole in 20 years, which would be the best she could get. The prosecution was asking for no possibility of parole ever. The judge decided and explained that being that she was very young and what have you, she should have the, the chance to at least try to get parole. But because of the heinousness of this crime, it should not be in 20 years. 20 years is not long enough. So he went with 50 years. And I think that that was a very good decision on his part. I think 50 years is good. And he actually did say, one of the issues you have to look at is whether Ezra will be a threat to society if she is allowed back out, which I think is the absolute number one thing people have to consider because there are so many people that get let out that should not have been let, let out. For instance, the Anthony Pardon case, which I'm not going to get into now, he should have never gotten out. There's lots of people that shouldn't get out. There's certain cases where you know that this person is not going to be reformed. So you kind of have to decide how dangerous that person is. The judge seemed to think that Ezra could be a danger, partially because it was such a heinous crime, because she kept lying, and because she really just refuses to admit that she is not the victim. She continues to play the victim and play that role, and she's not taking culpability for what she did. And he did say that there is a danger there, but he figures that after 50 years, she'll be in her 70, early 70, 71, depending on time served, which is about a year, I think they said. So maybe like 70, 71, she'll get out and she'll still have somewhat of a life left. This is the judge. He said she'll have somewhat of a life left, but by that time, she's likely not to be a threat to society anymore. So I thought that was interesting. He was kind of thinking, all right, 20 years, she still's kicking. She might be able to hurt somebody else. 30 years, 40 years, eh, 50 years is enough. And 50 years is a decent punishment for her, but still allowing her the chance at a life. Doesn't mean that she's going to get out. It means that she has the possibility to get out. It's just a parole hearing. She applies for a, a parole hearing, and then they decide whether they think she should be allowed out or not. The prosecution had a lot to say, which pissed off the defense. We'll get into the defense in a minute, because what the... The defense, wow. Ezra and her defense attorney, the female attorney, perfect for each other. Ridiculous. The prosecutor did explain that we, we go by four standards when deciding what is best for jail time for someone. And they base it on whether they're a danger to the society whether there's a chance that they, they can be reformed, how heinous the crime was, the nature of the crime, and the character of the accused, the convicted's character, the way she is. So given all of that, clearly they decided she's a danger. She needs to be punished. She still hasn't shown that she feels bad about anything, and what have you. I'm going to jump around a little bit with this case. I want to talk about some of the things that I think matter the most. So at the end of this hearing, right before the judge handed down the sentencing, Ezra did speak. And that one, that was interesting too. And it, it just, it just goes to show her character again. She needs to get the last word. She wants to be in charge. She wants to have a spotlight and she wants to get the last word. I thought it came across very arrogant and rude and ingenuine and just not good. She basically apologized to Alex's family. She said she was so, so sorry, but that just the words, I'm sorry, don't cut it. I'm sorry does not cut it because it's so much more than that. And that Alex was a wonderful person and she loved him and she wished it wouldn't have happened and all this and that and the other. She gave this sorry, the sorry story, and it was sorry, to Alex's family while basically looking right at the judge, it seemed like to me the majority of the time. She didn't cry during her speech. She just did her, you know, sad, I'm, I'm pretending to be sad, you know, eyebrows, puppy dog eyebrow face, whatever. 
um, to give the appearance that she felt bad and that she was upset about it. The judge said, literally after she finished what she was saying, the judge was like, whoosh, okay. As if it was just exhausting to go through this whole ordeal. And he did go into detail about how this case has kind of affected him and he's thought about it so much since day one. He went on to say that, like I said, Ezra has not shown any remorse. She doesn't feel bad about it. Nonetheless, she did just say she was sorry to the family, but the judge stated that I didn't find that genuine. I didn't think that she was being sincere. And it was he was just speaking everything I was thinking. It sounded like total bullshit. She's just trying to come across okay to save her own ass to get a better sentencing. And in all honesty, I think it backfired. Mind you, the judge most likely knew which direction he was heading. He did say, I mean, they do assessments to see a panel decides what the deal is with Ezra as far as if she's a danger, what the punitive damages should be, all that kind of stuff. And they recommended 50 years till parole. And that's what the judge gave. So I think he already kind of had a, a some, some of a decision already planned out. And then obviously he listens to what they have to say and goes from there. And I really think that Ezra, not only Ezra, with her horrible I'm sorry speech, but also her attorney did a terrible job of trying to persuade this judge to be lenient on her. They really just dug their own grave. They just... They just tore the ground apart and threw her ass in it. I don't know what was going on with this defense attorney. She was a disaster. She was a mess. Let me talk about the defense attorney and why she was just awful. She made so many idiotic comments that made her look just as awful, if not worse almost, than Ezra McCandless herself. I have never, that I can think of, really seen a lot of objections during a sentencing hearing. And I saw several of them in this sentencing hearing by the defense. And it was interesting because the, the defense had already objected two, two previous times during the sentencing hearing. On the third objection, she said, Your Honor, I'm just gonna have to object. I didn't plan on objecting during the prosecution sentencing. While the prosecution was talking during the sentencing, I didn't plan on doing it but I just have to, blah, blah, blah. And I'm watching this and thinking, you're you're telling us that you had no intention of um, objecting, but you've already done it twice. Why Wouldn't you have said that the first time you objected, but you wait till the third objection and then you say, didn't plan on doing it, but this is my third time. What the, what the hell was she doing? She made such awful comments that were belittling to everyone. She was belittling to the courtroom as a whole, the way their justice system works in that location. She was belittling to the judge, to the family of Alex and Alex himself, to the prosecution, and even her own witness. She kind of shit on with a lot of the things she said. And at one point, she seemed to be complaining that the prosecution had just too much going on over there. They were saying too much. They had too many people talking. Several times she said, in my 39 years of doing this, I have never, I've never heard of a prosecution acting this way. I've never objected in a sentencing hearing. In my 39 years, I've never objected, but the third time here was the charm. Oof. She said, victims are victims, basically. The, the, the pain is all the same. Everybody grieves this. It's all, it's all sad to everybody, but it's equal. Everybody's equally sad. So there's no difference between how Alex's family feels and how another victim's family feels. So basically, to hear everybody give their opinion on it and their victim statement, their victim impact speech is kind of unnecessary because we should already understand how they're feeling because there's all these other victims of the world that feel exactly the same. I was shocked. How disrespectful is that to say with all of Alex's family members there listening to her? I was disgusted. I was truly disgusted. 
Then the prosecution wanted to discuss an essay that Ezra McCandless had written while she was in high school. And it was regarding Ted Bundy. And she was kind of comparing, it sounded to me like she was comparing herself to Ted Bundy. I'm not really sure exactly, but they went into how Ted Bundy doesn't have empathy for people. He doesn't, he doesn't feel bad for people. He doesn't have any remorse, but in a good way. She talked about how Ezra was fascinated with psychopaths, Ted Bundy being one of them, which is why she wrote this essay. And one of the quotes that Ted Bundy had said that Ezra had put in the essay was, I don't feel guilty for anything. And Ted Bundy, he didn't have any sympathy. He didn't feel bad. He didn't have any empathy. He could cry when he thought it was a good time to cry. He could cry when he thought he should be crying in front of certain people. He cried when he thought that was the right time to cry, but it was fake crying and blah, blah, blah. And they were kind of saying her fascination with Ted Bundy and the things that she's talking about sound very similar to herself. So the defense objected to this and was very bothered by it. This was one of the times, this was the one where she said, I've never objected in the 39 years that I have been an attorney, but this is just too much. I don't know if the prosecution is trying to play up to the cameras or what they're doing, but bringing in an essay that Ezra McCandless wrote back in high school is completely irrelevant and prejudicial to this case. And they went on to explain that, yeah, she wrote this essay in high school. Mind you, she was 20 when this happened. High school wasn't that much earlier than when this murder happened. It wasn't that many years away. But also, she didn't just write the essay in high school. She talked about the essay with Jason. So it is relevant. They texted back and forth about the things she thought about with, with regard to this essay and with regard to Ted Bundy and her fascination with psychopaths. So it was very relevant. And the judge was basically saying, look, the court can un will be able to understand what to take into consideration and what not to take into consideration. And that's the thing too. This was not a jury deciding a penalty. This was the judge deciding the penalty. So this defense attorney is basically telling the judge, you're going to, you're not going to know how to decipher what is allowed and what is not allowed and what you should review and what you should not review. And he's saying, look, the court, meaning me, the judge knows the rules and knows how to decide how we're going to sentence this person. So it was absolute bullshit. But then to say the prosecution is working, is playing up to the cameras. That was a, just disrespectful towards the prosecution. And it was, it just made her look so bad. Her defense was just pulling shit out of her ass. That was just digging a deeper hole for Ezra. I don't know what the deal was. I mean, man, was she trying to help her out with an appeal so that she could say, look, my attorney shit the bed when we were in the sentencing hearing or else I could have gotten only 20 years. I mean, it was a freaking disaster. And then the prosecution talked about how Ezra had drawn a, a picture of herself but it was just Ezra's body with a fox's head. So she drew herself like this and called herself the tricky one and said something to the effect of that she was the tricky one, that she had to kill demons using a box cutter. And things like that just showed her lack of remorse in murdering someone. And it was just a funky ass thing to, to draw and to write and just bonkers. The whole thing was bonkers. Another thing I didn't know happened. I didn't realize that they actually make Ezra pay restitution to the family members for like gas, missed wages, court costs, whatever. So she owed, she ends up owing the family like $6,000, maybe $9,000. I'm sorry. I can't remember. I'd have to look back a, a decent amount of money when you're in prison, the state requirement is to take 50% of her prison wages for the job she has to pay for this restitution. So she's only going to be getting half of what she earns in jail, which I don't know. What do you get? Like 25 cents an hour or something like that. It's something. I hope it's something really low because they shouldn't be getting paid really in there anyway. But also 
any of the money that, that they have put into their account from like family members or what have you, 50% of that gets taken out too. So until she pays up this amount, she's only going to be getting 50% of whatever she has. I guess somebody could just put a bunch of money in her account to pay it off quickly and then continue on from scratch. I don't know. I didn't know that was something that happened. The prosecution also brought up the fact that there was a GoFundMe page for Ezra. And actually, I, had, I didn't know about this until a viewer commented telling me about this and how there was a GoFundMe page for Ezra to try to pay for her appeal case and what have you and they were selling drawings that she did while she was in trial so the prosecution starts talking about that and how setting up a gofundme page just continues to say that she's the victim on the gofundme page itself it goes in to talk about how ezra is a survivor she's the victim she's a survivor she was the victim for 15 days each day of the trial Shouldn't say anything about Alex, any regret towards Alex. Everything is about her being the victim. And she goes into the fact that her gender fluidity is the reason that she's being prosecuted. How dare you be a woman with more than one sexual partner? How dare you be gender fluid? How dare? It said stuff like that, a bunch of those. That was not even an issue really during the court case that's probably an issue in Ezra's own mind because she obviously went back and forth on her gender so she did go through some confusing times she had some tough times in her teens the court didn't go after her for that and the judge made a comment about how she did go through a lot of issues so there was a lot going on with her and that she had that surgery that she hadn't recovered from so so wonderfully and whatnot. I don't know anything about surgery. So I'm curious what that is. If anybody knows anything about that, please post it below. Let me know if you can find that out. I would love to know what the judge was talking about with that. I don't remember hearing anything about that in court, but I mean, it must have been brought up. So they talk about the GoFundMe page and if she's up there saying she's a victim and all this stuff, and she's a survivor after 15 days on trial being the victim again. It was not fair and she needs to appeal. So, you know, go fund me. And the defense again objected. Ezra's defense attorney was very quick to object to the comments regarding the GoFundMe page for Ezra. But repeatedly, she said that the page has been defunct. Defunct, defunct, defunct. She also explained that Ezra was in jail when this was being created, so she hadn't had anything to do with it. Of course, we know that she couldn't have been the one that was giving this information to other people to get some money for her. But uh, here we have the GoFundMe page, and it does show that it is defunct or deactivated. But we also see that there is this Joshua Meeks that has created a GoFundMe page for Ezra where she is selling her pictures that she was drawing during the trial. This is day one. This is another one. And you can see here the original has been sold. Also photographs that she has made are being sold. Pictures of herself, pictures of nature pictures of oh, Claire, picture of what seems to be her buddy Jason, an interesting one where she's laying there with her skull. And this one's the best, the eyes of a killer. And here's the eyes of a killer again. So let's get into who spoke for Ezra quickly. Obviously, this is her mother. She did speak for her and explain that she did not raise a child that would kill someone intentionally without any cause. So she continued with the defense that it was an attack, but she basically went into the way her daughter is, and there were several other family members. But there were two in particular that I found very interesting, and that would be um, this woman here is uh, a previous cellmate of Ezra's, who testified that she did not plan on having any friends in jail. She was there on her third DUI, um, seemed like a decent person. She said that Ezra was just so wonderful and, you know, compassionate and caring and upbeat that she just couldn't help but be friends with her. And so she was testifying on her behalf to show what a good person she was. 
the defense attorney had also mentioned that Ezra had given up her laundry position, which was a great job in the jail, to help out a fellow inmate um, that was going towards a parole hearing, and Ezra wanted to help her look responsible for the parole hearing. So again, she's showing that she, she is not selfish, she is selfless. And of course, that has nothing to do with her trying to look good for her sentencing. The final person that spoke that was a big su surprise to me was Mr. Sipple. This was the man that Ezra went to on the day that she killed Alex, asking for him to help her by taking her to the doctor or the hospital. He got up on the stand and said he was not there to take sides. Um, he just basically said what had happened and how he made he felt about it and basically just said that he hopes that him and Ezra could continue to be friends. All this showed to me was massive manipulation and could have backfired on Ezra. This man that had really endured a very traumatizing situation in dealing with Ezra had now considered her to be his friend and ended things saying, like I said, that he hoped that they would remain friends. Would Ezra really consider him a friend? Would she consider anyone a friend? Or is this just another way of getting what she wants and getting someone to help her through her sentencing? She seems to me to be a very self-involved person, and this was shown throughout her journals. The prosecution showed Ezra's complete lack of empathy and caring for other people when they read from her journal, one of which was in relation to how she supposedly felt about Alex, saying that, and this is paraphrasing, it is not the correct quote, but that their number was not even in her phone, a red nose, too big for his face, bulging forehead, porous skin, pale, sick every time they smile, makes me feel like I have a thousand bugs underneath my skin. A horrible thing to write or say about someone else, which is probably why the defense chose to object again, saying that they were told there would only be four letters read and there had been way more, and that they were somewhat shocked by the prosecution sentencing hearing that uh, they had been given thousands of pages to review and they hadn't had time. And she thought maybe she had to call a recess so that she could review some of this, the thousands of pages that she had been given by the prosecution during deposition. So she did have time. And the prosecution also explained that they do not have to tell the defense what they're going to use during the sentencing hearing. They have all of it there for them to review and whether or not they review these thousands of pages throughout this time frame is really their problem. The defense then wanted to put it on record that they believe the prosecution had lack of professional courtesy to which the judge, the judge said, well, yes, I think you've already done that. The prosecution then went on to read letters that Ezra had written while she was in jail. Some of the things that were said were mocha time when I come home. I want to whiten teeth. Lucky to be blessed with family I have. Most kids are born into it, but I was chosen, chosen so I'm special, right? Promised Jason I would not cut it regarding her hair getting long. He likes long locks. Of course, if you see her in sentencing, not anymore. The haircut is definitely back. She talked about missing summer garage sales, but she'd be back next year. And mega super excited to do ombre hair and rock this look. Well, I guess she doesn't plan on doing that anymore. The defense also talked about some of the things that Ezra had written. Two of which are, I know I'm not innocent. I can only strive not to do this again. What the fuck? There's so much more to discuss with this case, with this sentencing, that I could go on forever. So I'm going to end it here. And I may be back with another video about this. I may not. Please leave any comments you have regarding the case, the sentencing, this video. And I'll see you on the next video. Thanks a lot, guys. Have a wonderful day, as always. Bye.